What would you do if you were stranded on an island north of Russia where polar bears might eat you alive before you run out of things to eat or before you freeze to death? Would it matter if it happened today or 400 years ago? And would it matter if you were alone or with an entire crew of 17 men? What if your food and water supply would run low? Would you be able to drink melted snow and turn foxes so you could eat them? Sounds like a nightmare, right? Well, in 1596, this nightmare became a reality for a total of 17 men who became stranded on the island of Nova Zembla. In this video, we are going to talk about these brave men who had to go through hell in order to survive and to see their friends and families again. Trade flourished in 1588 and especially the Dutch were desperate to better that position in the international trade. Before 1588, it was mainly the Spanish and Portuguese who made use of international trade by sea, but around 1588, there were also English and French privateers at sea who were a threat to the Spanish and Portuguese. The Portuguese, therefore, had more difficulty in bringing products from Asia to the European markets. However, Dutch merchants with extensive international trade knowledge gained more traction because the Portuguese hired Dutch sailors to sail to Asia, allowing the Dutch to gain more knowledge. Next to Willem Barends, there was Jan Huygen van Linschoten, who collected data about Asian trade and shipping routes from 1583 to 1590, which turned out to be an important set piece for the Dutch to better their trade position in the international market. 1595 and 1596, van Linschoten published two books that formed an encyclopedia for trade and navigation in Asia. This was precisely the missing information the Dutch needed to set up their own expeditions with highest probability of success. The Portuguese ships sailing to Asia sailed across the southern hemisphere. During these voyages, the passengers were exhausted by the tropical heat and were plagued by infectious diseases that claimed many victims. Also, the drinking water and food spoiled quickly in the heat. The Dutch wanted an alternative to the southern route, the northern route. The northern route would prevent food spoilage and there would be no chance of encountering rival Spanish or Portuguese ships. This alternative route was pioneered by Willem Barens. Willem Barens was a merchant and scientist who conducted three sea expeditions from 1594 to 1597 to find a passage to India and China through the northeast from the Netherlands. Barnes was 40 years old and a father to five children. On his first trip, Barnes struggled to sail through the ice, while another expedition, led by Cornelis Nye, did manage to sail through the ice and penetrate into the Kyle Sea before sailing back to the Netherlands. The success of the expedition by Cornelis Nye gave Barnes a lot of enthusiasm and new hope for a second expedition, together with Jacob van Heemskerk. Cornelis Nye and Van Linschoten on the ship De Windhond. However, they were stopped by the ice once again, thus the Karasi was not reached. Barnes did not lose hope, allowing the idea for a third expedition to enter his mind. Barnes took navigation lessons and met Petrus Plantius. Plantius believed that the passage should not be sought through Siberia, but much further north, because he thought that the area above Nova Zembla would be all open sea. They had to find men whom were willing to sail along on this journey. There were a number of requirements to join the crew. One of the requirements was they had to be unmarried, so that no desire for wife and children would reduce their perseverance and desire to travel home. In addition, the men had to be young and naturally were inexperienced. After the assembly of the men, the decision was made to sail with two ships. One ship would be under the command of Jan Cornelisson Rijp, the other ship under Jacob van Heemskerk. Willem Barends was helsman on this ship. Gerrit de Veer wrote a diary of this journey, which I use as a main source of information for this video. The crew departed from Amsterdam in May 1596. Barends was the most experienced sailor and was responsible for the navigation. They followed a different route than the previous two trips. Plantius had drawn up the instructions and made it a real voyage of discovery. From the North Cape of Norway, the ships had to sail in a straight line to the north. Plantius thought that the North Pole was all open sea and navigable. However, the more they sailed north, the more they encountered ice, 
which made Barents grew less confident in the route of Plantius. Barents and Ripe soon had a different opinion about the route to follow. Ripe had heard to Plantius guidelines to keep sailing as far north as possible, while Barents wanted to change direction to the northeast, where he thought there would be less ice. Plantius and Ripe believed that the ice they encountered was just temporarily that they just had to go through to reach open sea. After a long discussion, it was decided to continue north. After several weeks of sailing, they encountered impenetrable ice and there was no other option but to sail south again. On the way back, they discovered two islands, Bear Island and Spitsbergen. At Bear Island, the discussion started again, which route they should take. According to Ripe, they should try again to go north while Barents insisted on going northeast. The two ships decided to part ways. Barents went northeast and Rijp went north. The second attempt by Rijp also failed, so he set sail back to the Netherlands. He arrived in the Netherlands in the autumn of 1596, while Barents and his crew had a much different conclusion. While sailing northeast, Barents encountered less open sea and more ice. On August 26th, the wind blew really hard, therefore the ice around the ship moved so violently that the ship got stuck. Three men jumped off the ship to try and break the ship free. They tried everything, but without success. The ship was strongly pulled back and forth by the wind, which almost resulted in a collision between the three men and the ship, barely escaping death by grabbing a rope and being hoisted on board. They eventually came to a halt near the island of Nova Zembla. Ice was all around the ship and they had nowhere to go. The crew went ashore to inspect how bad the ship was trapped in the ice. The rear end of the ship was completely trapped. After the winds grew weaker, the crew tried to break the ice around the back of the ship with crowbars and other tools. Unfortunately, that did not work and the ice did not float away by itself. This enticed fear in the crew. Because of the extreme cold, they had to stay inside the ship most of the day food and water supplies were starting to run out. Eventually, a number of men decided to go ashore to explore the land and see if they could find anything that they could use to survive. They discovered a river of fresh water and traces of deer or moose. There was also a large pile of driftwood. Eventually, the crew realized that they would not be able to return and that they would have to stay the entire winter. They were all scared and wished they could go back to the Netherlands. However, they had no choice but to stay and try to survive. The crew decided to go ashore and find the driftwood. Eight men went ashore, well armed with muskets. There were no trees growing on the island of Nova Zembla. Therefore, the pile of driftwood was happily welcomed by the crew. They were overjoyed because they would have enough wood to keep them warm all winter long. With the excess wood, they decided to build a house. To survive, they of course not only needed shelter, but also food and water. In terms of food, they had meat, fish and bread. They also caught and ate many foxes by shooting the foxes or using fox traps. One man even managed to kill a fox by throwing his axe. They also skinned foxes to make warm hats from the fur. Afterwards, the men made shoes from the hats, because the leather from the regular shoes had become so hard that they could no longer wear it. In terms of drinking, they had beer and wine, but most of the beer had already been lost and the rest had lost its alcoholic strength. In addition, the men drank melted snow. They had a cook that prepared this. They hated the taste of the melted snow and were disappointed in the fact that there was almost no good beer or wine left. After they decided the place where they wanted to build a house, the crew made two sledges from the wood which they used to collect and move the wood from the pile of driftwood to the site. After working a couple of days, three polar bears approached the ship. One bear hid behind a piece of ice and the other two came closer to the ship. The crew saw this and pointed their muskets at the two bears. One bear approached the top on the shore. The crew used this top to soak their meat. The bear snatched a piece of meat. One of the men pulled the trigger and shot the bear straight in the head. The bear dropped dead on the spot. Then something unusual happened. The other bear stood still, staring at his dead buddy, as if surprised that he lay still. He sniffed at him and then fled the scene. The crew wanted to inspect the dead bear. 
they decided to go ashore and approach the carcass. They were cautious of the other bears. They surveyed the area carefully, then approached the carcass. They cut open the dead bear and took out its intestines. During the cutting, the other bear came back and approached the crew. The men were all terrified of the bear. The bear cut up on his hind legs and just before he could attack, one of the men shot his musket in the bear's belly. The bear roared and dropped to all fours and then walked away. After they cut open a dead bear, they set it on four legs to freeze it. They wanted to take the dead bear back to the homeland once the ships break free. In the following days, the crew went to collect as much wood as possible. They used two sledges and went to collect the wood each time with 13 men. Each sled was pulled by five men and three men stayed behind by the pal, cutting the logs smaller, making the loads lighter. They were only able to make two trips a day. They had to walk 6000 steps for each trip. Not only did they have to walk far, but it was so very cold, which made it a very difficult task for them. They eventually piled a large pile of wood. The only professional woodworker died two days before they started building the house. The men were all very sad for the woodworker and mourned him. While building a skeleton for the house, the cold caused the nails to freeze to their lips while they were holding the nails in their mouth. When they would take the nail out, they pulled the skin with it causing it to bleed. It was really tough for them to go on. But to stop and just give up was not an option. Luckily, they were able to finish building the house after a couple of days of hard work. The men were finally able to sleep inside the house, although it wasn't a comfortable experience and there were almost no blankets. On top of that, they had not yet prepared the chimney, so they could not leave the fire on all night. Because of this, it was very cold the first night. At one point, someone suggested closing the doors and chimney while burning the coals to keep the heat in for longer. This worked, but eventually caused the men to almost suffocate. One of the men even passed out. They opened the doors and chimney again to let the cold in. It was so cold that the leather of the shoes froze, preventing them from wearing the shoes. They made white wooden shoes with sheepskin on top in which they could wear three or four pairs of socks on top of each other. The fire they used for cooking and keeping it warm created a lot of smoke in the house, sometimes so much that they could not be close to the fire. They would try and make some stones hot to take the bed with them, for the cold was as unbearable as the smoke. When they couldn't go out due to the cold, they set up an hourglass that lasted 12 hours and then turned it back over after 12 hours to keep an eye on the time. It was very easy to forget which day or what time it was, but they tried to keep track through a diary that Gerard de Veer was writing. There were a lot of cold days ahead of them, and they were very scared that they would not be able to survive. The following days, the men had a number of confrontations with bears as the men brought their supplies from the ship to the house, their food, beer and wine. The sun showed itself less and less, and the men had less hope that they would be able to go home before next summer. The men took everything they needed from the ship and put them on the two sledges. When the last sled was loaded and they were in a harness to hold the cargo to the ship, Bounce looked back and saw three bears walking behind them. He screamed to scare the bears away, but it didn't work and the other men quickly jumped out of their harness to defend themselves against the bears. They only had two helmets and no muskets. A helmet is a two-handed pole weapon. Bounce and Fear both took a helmet to ward off the bears. The other men ran back to the ship. On the way to the ship, one of the men fell into a crack in the ice. They feared the bears would go to the fallen men. Fortunately, the bears followed the other men who had just boarded. This gave the stumbled man enough time to scramble to his feet and climb aboard with Barents and the fear on the other side of the ship. The bears roared and charged furiously towards the ship. The men had only two helmets with them, which wouldn't be enough to protect themselves. The men tried to make fire to scare away the bears with burning torches. In the meantime, the men threw pieces of wood at the bears, which the bears kept chasing like dogs. In the absence of a firearm, it was not possible to make fire. One of the men threw a helmet at the largest bear and it hit him right on the snout. The bear fled with the other two bears on his heels, allowing the men to breathe and return to the house unharmed. Every time they encountered the bear, 
they feared for their life. This time it was no different. The man whom had fallen was scarred for life after this. However, he felt he was lucky to be able to survive. After a lot of struggle to survive, one of the men died because he had scurvy. The men were devastated because this was a friend whom they just lost. It reminded them that it could be soon over for them too, which made the men scared. However, they all pushed through because that was the only thing to do. After a couple of days, a large bear came to the house. The men fled inside and held the bear at gunpoint with their muskets. One man shot his musket as the bear came straight for the door. The bullet entered the front of its chest and came out by the tail. It was a very flat bullet, thin as a cup of penny. The bear jumped back when it felt the bullet. It walked a few yards from the house and then dropped to the ground. The men rushed out to check on the bear. The bear was still alive and lifted his head towards the men as if to see who did this to him. It seemed harmless, but the men didn't want to rely on that. They had often seen how strong an injured bear can be. With two muskets, the men shot the bear and then cut open the bear's abdomen and gutted it and dragged it to the house. There they skinned him and removed a hundred pounds of fat from his skin. After they melted the fat, it served as fuel for the lamps. They could keep the lights on all night with the melted fat. The bear's skin was 9 feet long and 7 feet wide. After the firewood had run out, they took another sled to the mountain of driftwood to collect more wood. With 11 well-armed men, they set out. Where they expected the wood, they could not find it because it lay deep under the snow. They had to walk a bit further until, with a lot of effort, they found some wood. On the way back, they began to despair. The cold and all the hardships weakened them to the point where they could barely tow the load, let alone the many loads they would have to carry over the next few months. But they all knew there was nothing they could do but to keep going. When they got back to the house, they saw a lot of open water in the sea in the distance. This open water gave the men new hope, and this new hope gave the men the strength they needed to carry on. Several weeks passed, and they had several confrontations with bears with each confrontation ends in a bear running away after it saw the men. It seemed as if fear was now engraved in the bears and they didn't dare to attack the men just like that. Around the beginning of May, a number of men had enough and wanted to leave with the longboat. Barnes was against this and indicated that he would like to leave with the longboat at the end of June or at the beginning of summer, but until then he wanted to wait to see if the ship would break free from the ice. Somewhere in June in 1597, the time had finally come. They decided to leave. They had prepared two longboats and were dragging the boats to the water. At this point, Barents was sick, along with another man named Klaas Andries. They both had scurvy. Each boat took one sick person and the men spread out over the boats and a day later, they sailed home with 15 men. On June the 20th, it was clear that Klaas Andries was very ill. They knew it would soon be the end for Andries. Around that time, Barnes said that it would soon also be the end for him too. Nobody realized that Barnes was that ill, because he just talked and drank along like the rest. After taking one more drink, he fell dead to the ground. Shortly afterwards, Andries also died. The crew was very sad that Barnes was dead. They trusted him and he was their leader and this was definitely a blowback for them. The following days they struggled a lot to set sail, but on July the 28th of 1597, 12 of the 17 men returned to civilization. The crew saw Russians on land. They were happy to see people, but on the other hand they were afraid because they saw at least 30 people and they did not know if they were savages or other strangers. With great difficulty the Dutchmen were able to reach the land and when the strangers saw the Dutchmen they left their work and came to the Dutchmen unarmed. The men approached the Russians and greeted each other very politely until they got closer and recognized a couple of Russians. They had been on the same ship with those Russians two years earlier. The Russians were quite shocked to see the state that the men were in and the fact they lost the ship. They could hardly understand each other because they did not speak each other's languages. But the Dutchmen were able to show the Russians how they were doing 
and the Russians pitied the Dutchmen. Together with the Russians, they went to drink a lot of wine and ate a lot of food. The Russians were very hospitable. This gave the Dutchmen a lot of hope and courage, partly because they had a blast with the Russians. The next day, they finally set sail back towards home. The men still had a long way to go and had a lot of struggle in front of them before they could reach the Netherlands. Luckily, they finally reached Amsterdam on the 1st of November. They all received a well-earned paycheck and after that each went their own way. The men all returned home to their family and friends and they all shared their amazing story with everyone. After Nova Zembla, the men whom had survived led an unremarkable life, except for Jacob van Heemskerk. Heemskerk took a few more voyages until he became commander-in-chief of a war fleet in 1607 and managed to defeat the Spaniards in battle. Unfortunately, he lost a leg and with it his life. After that, there was no longer any fear for the Portuguese and Spanish fleet and the Dutch founded the successful Verenigde oost indische Compagnie or the United East India Company. In 1993 and 1995, there were two expeditions whereby men dug up the house and many of the crew's belongings that have been excavated. Despite the fact that the men had to go through hell, they managed to hold out and persevere. On this note, I would like to end this video. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are or what you have to go through. You can get through it as long as you stick with it and keep going. Thank you for watching.